debated to myself uh, quite a bit whether or not I wanted to do this as a separate intro, and I decided in favor of that. Imperial Governors and Strategos. I played Strategos, which, depending on how you're capturing these and uh, getting a chance to view them, you might find them in slightly different places. Uh, over on my website and on Web Grognards, they're actually divided into different locations because they're from significantly different eras. Uh, other people might say, well, it's all just ancients, right? Yeah, but um, over on Board Game Geek, things are divided by, hey, what box did they come in? Well, this set of two games came in one box. Now, they share the same rules to the largest extent. Uh, so that was kind of a debate against, you know, trying to do the same rules again. But there are some significant differences, and where they share the same rules, it's almost like the common wargaming rules, except these are not the common wargaming rules um, that they share. There, there is a very uh, a, a significantly different system to both of these games from what most wargames have. Um, but they have their own changes between them. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to go into my overall history with the with the uh, uh, the game and the box and everything you know uh, I don't even really remember where I got this or when I think I bought it new but um, in specific with Imperial Governor I'm pretty sure I gave it a couple of shots and walked away with the well there's not really a game here and that's true. <laughs> In some ways, there's not. There's no victory conditions that would make sense to the modern gamer, and they didn't make sense to me back then. However, now, as the not-so-modern gamer <laughs> looking at them, I kind of see them in a sort of a role-play sort of fashion. Uh, and we'll figure out a way to deal with the never-ending potential nature of the game as we go through the rules. All right. Um, like with Strategos, you have basically a map of areas and some sea areas, which uh, aren't really the same kind of thing, um, that have an economic value. In this game, it's only a single economic value for an area. And then they have, and these are kind of hard to read, but with the camera, it looks like they're easier. Um, little uh, cities that have a value on them. Places that are ports have a little ship on them. Um, those are places where it's going to be easy, where, where you're able to uh, embark, basically. Um, you have some terrain differences. The brown terrain, like in Strategos, uh, is going to be harder to move through. The blue areas are just clear. However, these are the home nations of the six different empires. And there are going to be several different scenarios in this. All right, what else do you have? You have the regular playing counters, you have armies, which are numbered, fleets, which are numbered, and you have them for the six different powers. You have these, which are your ambassadors. Yep, single-sided counters. And then, and this is, if you remember, I used red and blue in the other game. You have a set of leaders that are named. And <laughs> they're not all from the same period, so you'll have like, uh, let's see, Scipio in here with Caesar and... Pompeii, and then over here you have uh, Anthony, you know, I, those names can be nothing. Um, what you're looking at is really kind of hard to tell, to tell you the truth. Uh, I think it's sort of a fantasy existence set in a vaguely the ancient world. Uh, you might be looking at something kind of like Pax Romana, and somebody had asked about Stratego versus, or Strategos versus uh, Pax Romana. They're not really reasonable comparisons, but this and Pax Romana probably are. Now, of course, I haven't played that damn thing since I videoed it, basically. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how much this matches or, you know, is worse than or better than uh, Pax Romana by playing it. And if you're used to Pax Romana, you'll be able to make that decision on yourself. Otherwise, well, you may have to rely on my kind of cruddy memory of something that was so far below, uh, before. Movement in this game is basically uh, five hexes, 
and it requires a leader to move. Uh, the one exception is when you enter rough terrain, you have to stop. Or if you enter a space with an enemy force that you can't overrun, you have to stop. Now, in order to get on a ship, you have to have your leader uh, in a port. And then you can add land units to that port. Um, your full movement is going to be the five hexes with a leader. A leader can only move each unit. Well, each unit can only be moved by one leader in a game turn, so you can't kind of like daisy chain uh, <laughs> and move something very quickly. Uh, okay, if you manage to get, uh, what, 500%? No. Yeah, if you manage to get at least uh, five times the size of someone and it's not a city, you can roll as you're moving a 500% attack and that has some risk of, of getting hurt as do all successful attacks <laughs> this combat chart is very strange it has worked very well over in strategos let's see how it works in this game which is looking at a very different time scale one where they don't even give you the time they don't give you a turn uh, track or anything like that uh, hidden movement stacks can't be examined you're allowed to stack as much as you like uh, you need a leader in order to start combat? Hmm, I wasn't sure about Oh, one question that I had in Strategos is explicitly handled in these rules, but not in the Strategos rules. And like I said, they kind of act like in the rulebook they're the same game, but there are definitely differences between the systems, uh, even in the course, even in some of the core aspects of the system. But in this game, they say we gave you extra counters that you can write values on. So the counter mix is not a limitation in this one. In Strategos, that was not obvious. Uh, at this point, I would say it probably shouldn't be. It had some unreasonable effects on play, and it would have actually been... I, I don't remember if I got to it in my review portion, but I certainly griped about it during play that this was having some kind of unintended effects because the pool of naval units is smaller than the pool of land units and that really hinders Athens especially in uh, that one. Okay, um, the way combat works is the as you move into an enemy's hex you have to have a leader with you you might start in their hex and you declare that you're going to attack. If you can't reach the 125, 125% column you failed. You just didn't attack. You get a no effect. If you reach at least the 125, you figure out an odds differential. Um, and that's rounded in favor of the defender always. And then you roll a die. And if you succeed in your attack, you will wipe out the enemy and perhaps take losses yourself. Uh, at the 125, you're going to take 25% losses. That might seem like a good trade against 100%, but it can actually work out to be larger than the force you're fighting if you're fighting somebody who's inside of the town. Because forces that are in the town get to add the town value. So like one strength point in here has a strength of six. To get 125% on that, uh, I would need, uh, I think eight strength points. Sounds right. Uh, I would need eight strength points. And if I took a quarter of eight, I would take two strength points while I'm killing one. Now, that's not so bad because I'm taking a city. But what if I got myself all the way up here to the four to one table on that and had to take 25% of my force? Well, instead of eight strength points, then I would need 32 strength points. And a quarter of 32 is going to be eight. And wow, you're already seeing that there are possibilities when you throw over a large force in that you take heavy damage. That's actually kind of acceptable to me. Uh, I like this better than some of the simpler, well, some of the other simple combat results tables that I've seen. At least for the ancient era. I think it works rather nicely. Um, and this one never gives you the, oh, I'm going to get a fantastic result, which Imperium Momentum 2 does. Uh, Imperium Momentum 2, you can pretty much guarantee that, yeah, you'll take losses. You always take losses in battle there, but uh, 
Oh, wait, maybe you don't. I'm trying to remember that. But you can pretty much guarantee you'll wipe out the enemy. Here, you need overwhelming odds to do that. Uh, you're not going to get, you know, a few bonuses off of your morale and leadership and everything that make it certain. For good or bad. That one models other things, but I don't think it models them very well. That's another game to compare this one to. Okay. Um, although, that one tends to be... That one's filled with historical scenarios at a very detailed point in time. This one is more that Pax Romana type feel where you're like expanding over <laughs> the Mediterranean and trying to take it all over. Uh, okay, so land and naval units are, uh, I believe, able to fight each other. Uh, so, but if... Because this game is a little different from the Strategos one, the only place you can disembark and fight is at a port, which means uh, your land units are stuck on board the Navy. You're not going to see the same kind of land units being able to defeat the naval units, you know, just because you're in a coastal hex or whatever, in quite the same way. Oh, no, actually you are able to do that. Uh, it's just you can't disembark the land units unless you're in a port for the fight. Okay, uh, we talked about fortified cities already there. Uh, one of the things from Strategos that's kind of weird, if you walk to an unoccupied city, all you need to have is a leader and the strength of that city, and then you end your turn there, and you take it over. And you take over a province by taking all the cities in the province. Okay. Um, in order to get the income from the province, you have to control it, which means you have to have captured all the cities, and you have to leave have at least one strength point in one of the cities as a garrison, and then you're able to uh, collect that income. And that income is just an individual, uh, a singular value of monies. Okay. After you count up all the monies that you get through all, the, all your different territories that you have control over, and note that if somebody takes one of your cities, neither of you are getting cash from it. Uh, that's important, and we saw the effect of that in Strategos. Um, at this point, you have to pay a maintenance, and maintenance is the big thing that Imperium Momentum is missing, um, which is one talent per unit starting the point that you have. Uh, you can buy additional forces. They cost you two talents each. Um, and then it says, which need not be paid on the same term that they are raised. What they mean by that is you don't have to pay the payment. You still have to pay that two talents each. Otherwise, the rule doesn't even make sense. And you have a limitation. You can only raise a number of units equal to the point value of a region which you control. You don't need leaders or anything like that, though. You can pick them up along the way. If, for some reason, you want to disband units, you have to pay three bucks per unit as the maintenance cost, essentially, and that gets the unit off the board. This is a big deal in the game. Um, disbanding units, it's not something you want to do if you are likely to use that unit in any time in the near future, but if it's stuck off in the middle of these bumfuck, well, disbanding it it saves you uh, money over the long run. And in the Strategos game, what was important about it was it could be a mechanism that allowed you to uh, access the counter mix. Here, that's not going to be an issue. We're going to always have counter mix. Um, gives you some rules on how to, you know, mechanically handle. <laughs> uh, how much money you have, etc., and how much income you have. I'm going to use something like I did with Strategos, where each power has its own list of provinces that it's ever captured, because they're ones that it's likely to get back, or at least be in contention for. I'm going to use uh, ink, uh, poker chips for the actual cash, and I'm not going to worry about trying to keep track of how many strength points they have on the board. I'll have to count that each time. The reason I have to count that each time is I can't keep a running total of something like that effectively so uh, okay all right now we get to stuff that's kind of weird comparatively so if you capture a leader 
which is just you know defeating them in combat or leaving a hex unoccupied, you're going to have to ransom it off. If it's a general, it costs half your current income. Your king will cost 75% of your current income. You must pay these values <laughs> before you're allowed to uh, pay your troops. Um, and I believe that applies to either one. The kings will have a slightly different picture. You have one picture for the regular leaders and one picture for the special leader who costs you more to lose. You don't have any special abilities. Um, and then when you pay him back, uh, what happens here? He goes back to your capital and then he's allowed to move normally that turn. It's possible you'll have lost so many leaders you can't pay all the percentages of income that you owe. That's terrible. And that money goes to the captor. If you manage to lose your entire home country, uh, well, if you manage to lose a city in your home country, your whole income of your home country doesn't go away. Instead, you lose 20% of the income of your home country, and you're not allowed to raise troops uh, in the cities that have fallen. If you lose all your cities, you can't raise troops there at all, nor do you get any income from your home country. Your king, however, is allowed to walk around with your treasury. Um, so although the invading player will draw the full income of what was your home country, you start to get your king's personal income, which is five talents per turn, and then, <laughs> and what this is all about, I got no idea. But note, Italy has an income of 10 at the beginning of the game to give it a boost for Rome. But everything else, um, if you lose your home country, you still get the cash from your home country, essentially, because the king has a magic bag of holding, something that uh, my wife is very disturbed by the term bag of holding. What bags aren't of holding? Aren't they lousy, broken bags? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. You have some kind of magic bag that's filled with, like, a mirror image of your income. And what's not covered here is what happens if you get your capital back. I think that money doesn't come back. Yeah, I think you don't end up doubling your income by playing that game. Uh, that'll keep some abuses from happening. If you happen to lose your home country and all your provinces, you're still not knocked out of the game. There is no player elimination in this game, and there is no role for ending the game except by uh, an agreed-upon time limit, uh, which isn't the base game. The base game basically has no ending rules whatsoever. So what happens is, if you lose everything, uh, you get to start again. You would have to pay your captor for the release of your leaders. You still have an income of five talents per turn, and you must pay him uh, to the limit of your purse. Uh, he then releases all your leaders wherever you wish in his empire. You're allowed to build units in the king's hex, and the additional capacity for a homeless, stateless player to build just one squadron on any coastal hex allows you to take to sea quickly with leaders. Well, not exactly, because you're not allowed to board except on a port, so that doesn't really help. But maybe there's another special rule that they're not mentioning. Oh. And here it says, with all leaders and possibly one legion to avoid further capture. My feeling there is that's intended to be, here's a special rule, um, because otherwise it doesn't matter. Should your king die this point, he may be replaced. If they don't die, they get captured. What? Uh, maybe they can die from the random events. I didn't talk about that. There's a random events uh, pile here. And there are some other tables that are based on the ran that are generated by the random events. There's another deck of cards here, which are bribes, and we'll get to them in a moment. Or in a while. Okay. Um, so maybe it's possible that you might be able to die, but I don't know. Um, and then they talk about your main chances, which are basically flee to an edge of the board and start up a new empire back there. Um, okay. If a client and a patron come to an agreement, the patron can give his client, this is defining the relationship here, his client a province, however small, which the client can now use as his new home country. <laughs> well, your home country, when you lose that, is when you get your five bucks. What? Yep. 
not everything's com you know spelled out here, right? We're going to have to make up rules all over the place. Um, and the client may use this as his home country. The patron should also defend the client in that country should an enemy invade. In return, the client must never attack the patron. And in addition, he adds the whole of his client's empire to his own when, adding, when calculating points for victory. Well, there are no points for victory. <laughs> Except if there's a time limit game where you add up the incomes of everything. Um, this relationship can be terminated either when it's agreeable to both parties or if the patron loses his home country. At that point, the client is now obligated to be released. Uh, in other cases, it might be possible that the client might be able to bribe the patron into agreeing to let him go. This all sounds like a bunch of bullshit, but whatever. There's this Pack of Fates card, which, geez, this reminds me of Wizards, actually. Oh no, Hammer of Thor, that's what the printing looks like. That was not an aerial game, was it? I don't think so. But it has that same kind of woodcut. I mean, you know. Uh, there's a bunch of storms. One is, in one of the 12 sea areas, you roll on this storm table to see which sea is under storm. And any squadrons not at port uh, will be sunk, drowned, destroyed, and removed from the board. And I assume if you have a leader, it comes back for free because it wasn't actually captured uh, in the home capital. 37 to 46 are revolts. There's a revolt in one of the provinces, not necessarily your own. You'll roll on a random events table of all the provinces. And uh, all leaders, legions, and squadrons in the coast of that province, which belong to the controlling player, are destroyed and removed from play. The leader will reappear on the capital. Uh, control of the province is lost and it has become neutral. Forces from other players, which happen to be in the province at the time, remain unharmed. Uh, 47 through 56 only affect the Romans because they have a greater income. Um, so they have some specific provinces which are specific cards which, if drawn by the Roman player, will cause a problem. If drawn by someone else, they do not. Uh, 57 to 66 are an additional income which you get each turn until you lose the card. You will lose the card because there are credit over cards which get rid of these and reshuffle the whole deck. Bonus cards are a pile of money that you get. And then there's some miscellaneous ones that have their own rules on them. Phew. Okay, that's most of the game. <laughs> but now we come to, and this kind of reminds me of... Uh, Popes and Princes, although nowhere near at the same scale. It's something that's been on my mind recently. Uh, for a couple of reasons, somebody asked about it in a thread, and I'm watching Popes and Princes, hoping to find a copy of it that I'm willing to pay for. And then somebody pointed to Jim Dunnigan's uh, uh, 100 Years War site, which I believe is based on popes and princes. There was an earlier version uh, that sort of sat in closer in between the two that was run as uh, a play-by-email type thing. Um, the Hundred Years' War thing, you're actually, it has an actual GUI type interface where you're moving units, and it still runs you on a, on a turn type basis, but where, where you did a couple of turns uh, a day, but it gave you a nice interface to interact, which was better than most of the earlier games. Um, but it no longer was quite as deep in terms of all kinds of special rules. <laughs> it still had a fair amount going on in it, like more than Empires in Arms did. Or, I'm sorry, Empires of the Middle Ages. That's a regular brain for me. Okay, but for diplomacy... So this is the most important aspect of the game. And no, it's not just free and simple diplomacy, but also you can see it ain't much. What is it? Well, you're able to open negotiations with another player who is either hostile or neutral. Uh, you have to place an ambassador counter, one of these, uh, face down on that player's capital. Oh, my face down? I don't know. I mean, it would work just fine face up. Uh, uh, during diplomacy, oh no, it has to be face down, and the opponent has the option to turn it face up in order to begin negotiations. 
Now, here we go. It is customary when seeking such an audience to offer a gift before negotiations. A gift of one, two, or five talents may be considered appropriate at the start of the game, and they suggest more and more. Each player is supplied with cards which represent different gifts, and they have things that you know, they have words on them to give you a little bit of role-playing aspect to it. When he wishes to use one, he must first purchase it at the appropriate price by deducting the sum from his war chest, paying chips in my case, and then he will present the card face down at the same time as he places his ambassador face down. Players should be, feel free to accept the gift but reject the embassy if they consider the gift too niggardly. Should the receiving player fail to turn over the ambassador counter, the embassy is rejected and negotiations cannot take place that turn. Players should note, however, that a gift of one talent often implies a threat, and they are strongly advised to listen, even after so poor a gift. When a player is in the midst of financial collapse and cannot buy an ambassadorial gift, he should petition any or all other players to loan him one talent. Okay, so now I'm getting mixed messages. Here it says it is customary, but now when they're talking about this, they're making it sound like you've got to do it. I don't know which they mean. Uh, and then you get the cash uh, if, if you take the gift. And I guess if you somehow refuse the gift, for which there's no rules for, uh, the money goes back to the person who bought it or something. Uh, when two players have concluded an offensive and defensive alliance, okay, well, we didn't talk about that. Uh, you keep an ambassador face up in each other in the other player's capital so they stay in constant touch without observing the niceties of gift giving. Once a particular war is over, however, and all alliance and that alliance has no immediate purpose, huh? Those standing embassies should be withdrawn. Ambassador counters do not act as normal units, may not move normally, may not okay. So there's this vague structure, and this is why it reminds me of Popes and Princes. There's this vague structure of something that feels like ooh, there's a lot missing from it. <laughs> and it's meant to do something. I don't know. Um, then we get to general notes. Rome is more powerful. Uh, people can do simultaneous movement. Set of different scenarios uh, to handle different numbers of players. These come closer to historical situations as opposed to that Pax Romana kind of, yeah, we're all around the med and we're growing our empires and we'll challenge each other. And I mean... Uh, the leaders don't matter, but whatever, you know, the, 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 the war between um, Carthage and Italy is going on as Alexander is coming from here. That's all fine, but if you don't knock Carthage out, I, I, I don't know. I don't even want to try to go into trying to figure this thing out in that sense. Um, all right. Uh, accelerated start and option. This is kind of like, you know, dealing out the properties in Monopoly. It, the idea is to give you something. It, it does a couple of things. One is, in some games, and Stellar Conquest comes to mind for this, there are potential advantages to doing sort of this first strike and just trying to wipe somebody out while they're off trying to colonize places. <laughs> and this may prevent that from happening to countries that don't have any, uh, you know, a, a large enough resource set. So you might be able to slip in and steal somebody's home country, but then of course they have the same income. You just have increased yours and again, I don't know. Um, but it also speeds things up to the point where, yeah, you actually have powers that are capable, you know, that, that it makes sense to clash with each other. I don't think that the expansion period in Strategos took very long. So I'm going to do it from the base game and not worry about this option. Um, and this doesn't add much. It generally adds one province, but in some cases it may add quite a few, which creates a less balanced game, which might be kind of neat as well. Okay, well, this can be a very long game, yeah. Since no player can drop out, no matter how badly they're faring, and since each player needs the active help of others, um, okay. Well, how do you win? 
Yeah, that's not spelled out. It follows, therefore, that the more players there are, the more likely it is to be an outright winner, i.e. a player who cannot successfully be opposed by a combination of all the other players. That's the victory conditions, which, as far as I'm concerned, come down to everybody agrees that somebody won. Is that terrible? Nah, I guess not. But, <laughs> you know, it would be nice. It's probably what would happen in actual fact, no matter what with the game. But rather than spelling out that you must conquer every province or something like that, no. <laughs> because that might be difficult. It might be very possible with the rules in the game for someone to keep running around and, you know, being really hard to get. So by not nailing that down, they kind of prevent a rules lawyering type situation, but they do still leave it open to somebody saying, well, no, 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 I can, I can oppose you because you can't kill me, you know, <laughs> which, yeah, that kind of dick maybe isn't great to play with, but yeah, one of my, one of my uh, best gaming buddies uh, over the years had been somebody who would pull something like that, <laughs> and we just smack him. Um, okay, and then they say a more realistic approach is to set a time limit to the game. <laughs> Why not set victory conditions? <laughs> um, and then you divide your income at the end uh, with the income that you had at start, and whoever has the higher resulting uh, total is the winner, which means Italy has to do twice as well as any as a, any of the other players in order to beat them. Uh, another is to award laurels to the player with the most talent in their war chest. This is the most successful businessman. What? This isn't a game about business. What? Um, and a final one, the whimsical, is to conduct a poll as to who has proved the most trustworthy ally. ally. What? <laughs> Just, it's like, you know, they were smoking pot and trying to come up with ways to end this thing. All right, that's what the game rules are like. And it's funny because Strategos has a pretty tight and nice set of rules. It's the same designer. This is the game, this is the big game in this box. Strategos was the afterthought, as far as I can tell. And certainly for me, this was the one that drew me in, um, towards wanting to play it. Now, one thing I haven't done is I haven't set up, you're allowed to start with, I think, a number of strength points equal to uh, your income at the beginning of the game, which allows you some quick expansion. So I'll be doing that fairly early. Right now, I just want to get this out. Eh, we spent a fair amount of time on this, so that's not too bad that we did an intro on it. And yes, I went through all the rules, kind of, sort of. All right, let's set it up.